Director. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very exciting meeting as a clinician to be at such a multidisciplinary meeting involving industry, uh, physics, medicine, biology on an equal playing field. Quite unusual. So I'm going to report the results of this work that our team at Sunnybrook in Toronto has done. The initial human evaluation of MRI-controlled transurethral ultrasound therapy for prostate cancer. Uh, just a brief declaration. The work we're presenting here was all funded by peer review grants from NCIC and the OICR, but the technology has been licensed to Profound Medical. And my two collaborators, Dr. Chopra and Bronsky, are shareholders, and I'm on the clinical advisory board. So uh, this is the first talk on prostate cancer. For those of you not so familiar with the field, the fundamental issue is that because of PSA screening, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of diagnosed cases, many of them clinically indolent, and it's increasingly recognized that overtreatment is a problem. So. Uh, there is a major unmet need for a precise, minimally invasive treatment with reduced side effects, and the numbers really are extraordinary compared to just about any other cancer site. This specific uh, favorable risk entity, about 150,000 patients per year in North America who could uh, benefit from this. And the technology that we have been working on for about the last eight years is a transurethral system. It's about an 18 French rigid device with a planar transducer, which is inserted transurethrally under an anesthetic and uh, generates thermal energy. It's done in the MR. The components are all MR compatible. It's done in the MR unit with MR uh, real-time mapping. And uh, the unique aspect of this is that the uh, thermal mapping information is used to control the speed of rotation and thus the energy delivered to the tissue. So it's essentially a fully automated system. Once you get the patient aligned, the transducer in the right position, you map out your target on the MR and the machine does the rest. And uh, this uh, is now been a, altogether about a 20-year saga, starting with the work by Diedrich and Heinonen on uh, ultrasound thermotherapy and MR mapping, and more recently, uh, initially uh, in silico simulations, in gels, in dogs, uh, which was about a four-year period of development, and now for the last year or so, the human studies. So we have gone through this in a very stepwise fashion, uh, mindful not to be too ambitious. And really the critical question for this initial so-called phase zero study was to establish, first of all, safety, but uh, more critically to determine the correlation between the imaging measurements in the human prostate and the actual thermal damage. How precise was this? How limited was the injury? What was the distance between the thermally ablated tissue and completely normal tissue? The rectum sits immediately behind the prostate. The distance from the prostate capsule to the rectum, typically three to five millimeters. And so it's absolutely critical if this is going to be a safe therapy that we know that, that, that uh, the uh, diffusion of, of thermal energy uh, is limited to less than that distance. So we picked patients for this study with low to intermediate risk prostate cancer. That means Gleason score seven or less, PSA less than 15, who, were, who had made a decision to have a radical prostatectomy. And this treatment was then offered to them immediately prior. To our surprise, patients were very amenable to this. Um, uh, to, to get uh, eight patients, we had to offer only to uh, 10 or 11 altogether. It seemed to be very appealing to patients. So the patients had the therapy. It was performed under a short-acting spinal anesthetic with sedation. The device was inserted, much like a rigid cystoscope is inserted. It's a very routine thing for urologists. And the patient was then wheeled into the MR suite, had the therapy, once this was done, they were taken up to the operating room 
and uh, given a general anesthetic, and they had a radical prostatectomy performed by myself. And these are the results. This shows the, the system in the MR unit. This is the transducer. You, uh, it's uh, designed to rotate. It's attached to a motor that turns it. There's the, um, the transducer uh, ultrasound elements arrayed along the, uh, these are one centimeter elements arrayed along the uh, transducer. So we've treated eight subjects. Uh, we showed that it, the device that we had developed could be inserted. There were no issues about failing to get it into the prostate. The patients tolerated it. The procedure time took three hours, about an hour and a half for, uh, actually that's, that's incorrect, uh, about half an hour for the spinal anesthetic and get the patient ready device positioning and treatment planning. We spent an hour on that. That was really the time-consuming aspect to this. Uh, we wanted the, the uh, device and the prostate perfectly lined up with the MR imaging and thermometry plane. The treatment delivery, only about 15 minutes. Post-treatment imaging to see the effect, and then the patient was taken out of the MR suite and taken up to the operating room. And for this phase, we, uh, the treatment, the goal was to heat the target boundary to 55 degrees centigrade with that PRF shift technique to measure the spatial heating pattern. And we measured three elements that you can see there. Uh, we only treated in the middle element, centimeter, uh, but uh, thermometry in uh, the two adjacent uh, planes. And so this is what it looks like. The, uh, this is uh, the target, the, uh, sorry, prostate boundary in green. The more or less arbitrary treatment target in black. And again, we were being conservative. We weren't interested in treating the whole prostate. We weren't interested in treating cancer. We wanted to see how well could we target and then treat and, and match up the thermally ablated tissue with the target. So, this is about a 13-minute treatment. It's speeded up considerably. And you can see, basically, i just like to run that again, if possible. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there we go. So you can see, the, the, once the device is turned on, the tissue heats up. The yellow is 55 degrees. The, the colorimetry is set, so you see a very dramatic difference between 54 and 55. And you can just see, real time, that the concordance between the 55 degree isotherm and the target area is really quite tight. This shows the uh, temperature measurement. Uh, you see very rapid rise in temperature above uh, to approximately 55 degrees. The uh, temperature measurements are really quite stable. Um, this is a work in evolution. This is a case that didn't go so well. You can see, first of all, the temperature measurements in this case have a much wider amplitude, less precision. Uh, in this case, there was some rectal movement, and that was interpreted as, uh, you can see, an increase in temperature of the rectum. So the safety device in the machine um, uh, uh, basically shut this off and you, there was significant inaccuracy between the uh, boundary and the, uh, and the area, the 55 degree isotherm in that case. And this shows seven of the eight cases. And first of all, the targeting accuracy between the target boundary and the 55 degree isotherm, in five of these seven cases, this targeting accuracy is in the range of one to 1.5 millimeters. There are two cases that did not go well. This case had had a microbubble injection the day prior as part of another study, and that clearly introduced an artifact which, the, uh, which showed up the next morning and resulted in a very poor outcome. And this patient had significant rectal movement. This was corrected in subsequent iteration of the software, and now, uh, and, and we don't think that will happen again. The average uh, radial distance between the boundary and the isotherm was 1.3 millimeters. If you exclude those two cases, it's only 0.2 plus or minus 1.6. So we feel this is very promising in terms of the uh, 
future for this therapy. We've looked at the histology, and there really is very tight concordance between the isotherm, the MR appearance, and the histology. And you can see a, uh, there are these three patterns. This area inside the yellow is completely fixed. The uh, tissue looks more or less normal, but is uh, because of the relatively high uh, t amount of energy that's delivered there, you don't actually see coagulation. It's got a glassy appearance. This tissue shows typical uh, thermal coagulation effects. This is the transition zone between the blue and the black that shows some evidence of thermal injury. And outside that area is completely normal tissue. So the important thing is this distance between the area of coagulation and the area of the outside of the area of thermal injury is only about uh, two millimeters. And this case had an area of cancer that happened to cross the uh, thermal coagulation boundary, and it essentially showed that the cancer was uh, completely coagulated inside and had normal characteristics similar to the surrounding tissue outside. No evidence of any differential effect between cancer and benign tissue. Uh, the, the maximal temperature along this thermal coagulation boundary, 50, roughly 55 degrees versus 51 degrees in the area of irreversible thermal injury. So to summarize, we think this is feasible in humans. The, stable, the MR measurement, temperature measurements are stable. The prostatic movement in a situation where there's a rigid instrument in the urethra and a cooling balloon in the rectum the, is minimal and doesn't seem to be a problem. The treatment delivery time is short, and the area of thermal damage has a very well demarcated boundary in the range of two millimeters, which seems to be safe. The next step for this technology is to evaluate it as, an, as a cancer treatment. We're going to do more or less the same thing, but actually identify the cancer on MR, treat the cancer, do the radical prostatectomy, see how effectively we've ablated the cancer. So we're just waiting to hear from our peer review funding agency about this. This, of course, is a major team effort, and uh, the uh, people listed here, particularly Michael Bronskill and Rajiv Chopra, have uh, led this team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this uh, very excellent presentation. We'd like to throw this open to questions now, please, from the audience. The question over here on the left, Director Bradley. Uh, did you have any impotence or incontinence from this study in the eight men or whatever the number was? So, yeah, I didn't really go into the surgical experience. Uh, first of all, the, the actual prostatectomy was quite uh, unexciting in all cases. There was no apparent evidence. I thought maybe the prostate would have turned to mush or be tough to resect surgically, but it was not. And the patients have had more or less what you'd expect. Uh, they have had some post-operative incontinence. This, this is resolved in most of them. Uh, one of the patients has some persistent incontinence, but there, there's no evidence of any uh, increase in morbidity in those patients. I can't, it, it, these have all been done more or less within the last year, so we don't really have any evidence on long-term erectile dysfunction rates at this point that would be meaningful. I'm sorry, that, that's uh, following surgery, right? Yeah. What about between ultrasound and surgery? Same day. That, that is about half an hour. Oh. <laughs> well. In continents, we might be able to evaluate, but erectile it's not California, dysfunction Bill. would be tough. <laughs> this is Canada. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on to the next paper? One question I have just a little bit on the histology afterwards. The, the, you're treating essentially the area of BPH, which is going to be heterogeneous tissue. Is that not correct in that transitional zone? Is, would that explain the heterogeneity that you saw at pathology? Well, uh, no. I, I, you're talking about those three zones? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we didn't particularly try to restrict it to the transition zone. No. There's no question we were treating some of the peripheral zone. Uh, I think it relates more probably to the 
uh, t temperature that's achieved and the, the rate of temperature rise. So with this rapid temperature rise right in the center of the tissue, it's clearly a more profound effect. Okay. That's a good point. All right. Thank you very much.